program tonight uh, brought to you by a grassroots um, group called Mashpee Clean Waters. We gather mostly on Facebook and around town to help drive change and uh, drive awareness to the waters. And we spent a lot of time talking about nitrogen and the salt water and we're long overdue to have this discussion about the ponds. So we have um, quite a, quite a uh, group of experts here that are going to share uh, some basic knowledge with you, but our goal really is to get through their brief overviews and then get to questions from the audience because I think that that's a really powerful way to, um, to learn and, and you know, understand the issues. So uh, Ashley Fisher, the Mashpee Director of National Resources is gonna kick things off. So Ashley, do you wanna share your screen or I can if you don't want to? Yeah, I can, I can share my screen, that's fine. Okay. Am I up? Yep. <laughs> so hi, good evening. My name is Ashley Fisher. I'm the Director of Natural Resources for the town of Mashpee. And I'm just gonna give you a general you know, information on um, cyanobacteria. <clears throat> So cyanobacteria is also referred to as blue-green algae. It's a microscopic organism that is both photosynthetic and a bacteria. Um, there are, are, um, are very old species, but they are known to bloom when the water is warm, stagnant, and rich in nutrients in both <coughs> phosphorus and nitrogen from sources such as runoff, septic tank over, overload, or um, groundwater infiltration from septic systems. There is also some other, you know, reasons behind why these blooms occur. Trace metals can also help in, in the um, occurrence of the harmful algae, cyanobacteria blooms, pH changes, vertical mixing, aeration, alteration of the water flow, water temperature, and light availability. It is widely known that um, the increase in anthropogenic or human activities contributes to the growth of these cyanobacteria blooms. So nutrients, that's our major issue here on the Cape. Um, the areas or how they get to the waterways is through stormwater runoff, atmospheric deposition, organic decomposition from animal waste, decaying plant matter, everything in the watershed that's running off into our waterways. Um, fertilizer use and um, septic system or wastewater that's also getting to our groundwater and making its way to freshwater and saltwater environments. So when we see excess nutrients, this can result in eutrophication, um, which is defined by the excessive richness of nutrients in a lake or a water body. Um, and we're seeing excessive runoff and increased land uses with dense growth um, around our entire watershed. These dense blooms can uh, result in waterways closures, swim closures, recreation decline, and tourism loss. Fish kills have also known to occur in Santuit Pond and other waterways across the country due to low DO oxygen in the water column because of these cyanobacteria blooms. So how do we identify these blooms? So my team, along with other people, go out and we, we look for scum layers. So this is the notorious picturesque um, cyanobacteria blooms. There's a discoloration in our waterways. They're either glue, blue or green in pigmentation. Um, and we also see scum layers. So this is a textbook scum layer of a cyanobacteria bloom. And the Massachusetts Department of Public Health recommends that when in doubt, stay out. Um, cyanobacteria blooms can look like paint that's skimmed on the surface of the water. Um, so they recommend you report this to your local officials if you ever see anything like this occurring on, in your waterways. So when do we post advisories? We post advisories when there is a presence of a scum layer or the cell counts are exceeding 70,000 cells per milliliter. Now we collect samples from the water column and we go through them and we count each individual cell for of cyanobacteria and based on the counts, we will post an advisory. Now less often we do test for toxins and the, the toxin threshold is now eight per, parts per billion. So when microsystem toxin exceeds eight parts per billion, we will post an advisory. Um, the state of Massachusetts recommends that we enact a waterways or a water management program that we test the water column throughout the summer months. June, July, and August are the most, are the months that we see the algae blooms occurring across the state. 
So what we did in the match we, is we established a water quality monitoring program. And each week we go out, we test the waterways for cell counts, mm -hmm. presence of a scum layer, and um, less likely we go out and we check for microcystin, but that, that testing is less frequent. We do look for scum layer and cell counts. So this is just a slide to show you the dynamics of the cell counts. From one month, it can be as low as 5,000 cells per milliliter. And the next month, it can jump to 70,000 cells per milliliter. Um, scum layers are also variant on um, wind-driven. They can occur in multiple shorelines, or they can dissipate within a day. Um, this is our closure from a Schumann Pond this year. As you can see, this is a scum layer. Um, this was wind-driven highly. The next week, it was non-existent, and the cell counts dropped. So the town of Mashpee is also doing further testing on these toxins. Um, we're monitoring scum layers and we're checking the cell counts weekly. Um, this is what Scott Gallagher and Rick York will be discussing, but we've also um, deployed a HAPSTAT unit in Santua Pond, which is one of our ponds that we see routine algae blooms and cyanobacteria blooms every year. Um, this is our current status of the ponds and most of our ponds are at the low status. And this is from the APCC website. Um, Santuit Pond still has an advisory out. So solutions and recommendations. What do we do here? We enact wastewater management programs. Um, we reduce our fertilizers in our lawns and we limit water usage. So that's all for me. It's been five minutes. <laughs> so Rick um, and Scott, you can take over and just tell them about your um, Habstat unit and what you're doing in Santuit Pond. Scott, you're, you're muted. These are the technical guys. We're, yeah, uh, go ahead. Oh, Mary, are, are we next or APCC? I don't, um, I don't see this. Um, actually, you're right. Um, Kevin Johnson, we're gonna have Kevin Johnson go next. Um, you wanna jump in, Kevin? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi everyone, um, thank you for including us at APCC in this talk. Um, we've been uh, monitoring in Mashpee and Santuit in particular for a number of years um, with some grant interest and uh, just other monitoring um, on top of uh, the typical monitoring that we provide um, you know, throughout the town and uh, other towns um, on a biweekly basis over the years. Um, this year, we're monitoring in all 15 towns on Cape Cod through our cyanobacteria monitoring program. Uh, we're at 144 ponds total that are monitored on a biweekly basis uh, with, uh, through partnerships, uh, contracts, and, and grant, um, grant partnerships uh, across the region. Uh, we take the data that we have and develop uh, to pass on to health agents for guidance, help identify, you know, potential issues um, that they, they can take, uh, potentially um, lead to additional testing. Um, and we can keep ev everybody informed uh, using this mef method, be even able to provide the coverage that we do. Um, the method that we use is a EPA approved method developed by the UNH Center for Freshwater Biology and Limtex. That's uh, Jim Haney and Nancy Leland. Um, Comparative to a cell count method for identifying cyanobacteria biomass, we prefer the phycocyanin method for determining uh, cyanobacteria biomass through it and through the, some of the other elements of Nancy and Jim's research. We're able to uh, project where uh, blooms may be forming um, just by tracking the bloom forming cyanobacteria uh, that we measure in the water column. Um, these are the, the larger cyanobacteria um, that might accumulate on shore. Um, and we've had great success with that over the years in terms of being proactive about potential cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, we also um, have regressions that can help identify potential toxin issues based on genus specific data uh, for phycocyanin. Um, so what we're able to provide is uh, forewarning for cyanobacteria bloom occurrence, as well as potential um, uh, cyanotoxin, um, and that's microcystin in particular, uh, exceedances 
And we are particularly concerned, of course, uh, with any cyanobacteria blooms or scums that might appear on shore and understanding the microcystin concentrations there. Um, this method that we use <clears throat> is complementary uh, phycocyanin and, and, and cell counts. Um, we've been talking and working with the uh, um, Massachusetts Department of Public Health in comparing um, methods and bringing on this terminology and uh, make this um, method more widely understood um, and for how useful it can be. Uh, we provide uh, this data, like I said, to um, health agents who can uh, take, take this and uh, use, use this guidance to post advisories when uh, they may be deemed necessary due to potential cyanobacteria bloom um, occurrence or potential concerns about um, the eight, eight parts per billion microcystin. Um, there may be additional testing that they might uh, go through with um, as needed. Uh, we also just try to communicate our data um, the, best, the best that we can on as soon as we can. Um, we create biweekly reports that we send to the health agents that we work with. Um, and that includes uh, the town of Mashpee. We've been trying to provide um, some data and work together with Ashley. Um, even though the, um, we monitor ponds in Mashpee through a grant um, for research pur purposes, we also keep an eye on you know, just, just what our data is saying to be able to pass that on. And we look with, to, with, with all this together to, um, with the data that we could provide um, to give guidance um, and help, help out um, with, with more information to give to health agents and, and other health, health officials, um, keep the public involved in cyanobacteria um, and uh, encourage conservation of our freshwater resources here on the Cape. Um, as part of part of a few of the goals of this program. And I, I, I think I'm at uh, five minutes or so now. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Kevin. Great context for the overall, um, that this isn't just a problem in Mashpee and all the work you're doing, so thank you. Um, so, right, um, we now have Scott Gallagher uh, and Rick York. Um, are, are you gonna share your own slides or do you want me to? Yes, I will share. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rick's going to start us off with a background on Santua Pond. Well, actually, it, it's um, we're monitoring uh, so, uh, the major ponds in Mashpee. Um, this is uh, work Ashley and Scott and I are doing um, on on the cyanobacteria monitoring in Mashpee. Um, so Ashley already showed you the warnings that we post. They're up at Santua Pond most years. Um, recently. Um, and then the water quality monitoring she mentioned, we use SONS or she uses the SONS and um, I do counts. And then we send samples to Brian over at SMAST for um, lab analysis as well. Um, so this is, these are some results of the phycocyanin from the exosond. It's, that's a measure of the blue-green color, which is the cyanobacteria. And uh, we, we had blooms with uh, had high levels of phycocyanin, and then we installed solar bee circulators, and that cut it down. You can see it went from 20 down to less than 10, and actually around three after a couple of years. But the solar bees are designed to keep the nutrients from coming out of the sediments. Then we had a heavy rain event in 2017 that washed a lot of nutrients in from the watershed and overwhelmed that. The same thing would have happened with alum treatment. Um, it's only designed for in-pond treatment. So. Um, that was a problem. Uh, we haven't overcome that <laughs> still from the 2017 event. Uh, but luckily, we've been able to keep where the oxygen has stayed high enough in that pond. It's a shallow pond that we haven't had any ma mass mortality of fish. The oxygen has stayed above two parts per million um, in our monitoring data. Um, so the Massachusetts Department of uh, Health did a study from 2009 to 20 to 2012, and um, we were monitoring from 2008 till ongoing, the present. Um, but it's interesting to look at this data for changes over time. And we found that there's higher maximum cell counts, the blooms are lasting longer, the dominant species are different, and the toxin content is different. So in uh, 2009 through 12, the, the maximum cell count was 278,800. Um, but in 2020 and 
2021, we had 500, over 500,000. Uh, the blooms used to last through November, and last year they went into January with a pretty thick bloom still. Um, and the, abun the most abundant species changed as well um, over time. So things are changing out there. And um, the other thing that we found is that there are fewer species, which is textbook for eutrophication. As you increase the nutrient levels, the species diversity goes down. So, um, and um, this, that was Santuit Pond. This is, uh, this year we've had a bloom in Mashpee Wakebee, primarily Wakebee Lake, which I didn't expect, maybe somebody did, but, um, and it was another kind of blue-green cyanobacteria called Dolichospermum lemmermanii, which makes a number of different toxins, including uh, paralytic shellfish poison toxins. We've been analyzing, we haven't detected um, those other toxins yet, but we're still working on that sample. So, um, so things are getting worse. And um, that's pretty much the quick overview from me. Okay, so what we're trying to do is develop technology that allows us to measure both the cell concentration of cyanohabs and their toxins in <coughs> real time, and then be able to distribute these sensors uh, around a pond or around many ponds and have that data be telemetered back to shore where managers can act within literally minutes. This uh, sampler uh, is a robotic microscope that takes a picture of each uh, bacterial cell as it goes through a flow cell. Uh, it then uh, collects a molecular fingerprint, and I'll talk a little bit about the spectroscopy and how that works. And then it identifies the cell and measures the toxin present using a AI type of uh, classifier. And then it sends the data back to shore and it does this four times a second. So you can imagine how, how much effort goes into somebody, you know, let's say a manager like Ashley goes out and takes a sample uh, in a pond maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Uh, if this is sampling four times a second, you can get answers back very, very rapidly. And uh, the ability to, to make measurements of toxins uh, is unique in the sense that it uh, otherwise it, a molecular uh, toxins <coughs> test, a like test or an abraxas strip, uh, these are all expensive and uh, take quite a long time uh, and are not necessarily as accurate as some of the techniques that we're developing. So the idea is that uh, this is a spectroscopy that uses a laser, and I won't go into any details, but just briefly, it's a laser and the reflected sample is analyzed with a spectrometer and it gives you a molecular fingerprint of the material that's in that cell. And very often that we can pick up the molecular fingerprint of toxins, and I'll mention uh, the types of toxins in a minute. Uh, so far we have about 30 different freshwater cyanohabs and about uh, 45 marine species. These are the freshwater species. And uh, this is microcystis. that's very common uh, in many of the, the ponds on the Cape, uh, St. Tuit Pond, where this is uh, sampling right now, uh, <coughs> a relatively low level of microcystis. And no, notice that the microcystis colonies are uh, actually housing hundreds to maybe a thousand individual cells, which are little black dots within a gelatinous matrix. And so the idea is that this sensor is imaging the entire uh, colony and also getting a molecular spectra on the colony itself. Uh, this is some data. The, the top blue line is the cyclical nature of the microcystis concentration on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. And it's highly variable and it, and it cycle, cycles over hours to days. And then in the orange line below it, or brown, uh, is the toxin concentration of microcystin LR, which is uh, the type of toxin that we most typically find in uh, microcystin. Uh, and in this case, the concentration was relatively low. 30 femtograms per cell is, is actually quite low. It's about eight micrograms per liter and is considered below the, the toxic level that is uh, EPA uh, has, has released. But the point being that this data was coming back four times per second and is coming back right now four times per second from Santuit Pond. Uh, this shows that, and uh, typically the, the, the Mass Department of Health, Public Health, uh, 
has shown that the uh, microcystin has been relatively low over the years. And then when we installed HAMSTATS in 2019, it also showed that microcystin was relatively low. Uh, and so far in 2021, it has been undetectable. So we're actually in a fairly low uh, level of uh, microcystis right now uh, in Santuit Pond. And again, this is just Santuit Pond at one location and it is highly variable throughout a pond and between ponds uh, due to weather conditions and nutrients and wind and et cetera. And then the structure of microcystin, the toxin on the right, just shows that how complex this molecule is, but it's the vibration of all those bonds that actually give it a very distinct uh, Raman spectroscopy signature. And this is to remind us on the left-hand column how many toxins there actually are in uh, blue-green algae. And, uh, you can find things like microcystins, nodularians, saxitoxins, anatoxins, all these have different structures. <laughs> and the point is that we can now measure most of these toxins directly and in real time. And that's the kind of technology that I think by distributing these sensors throughout a number of different drinking water and uh, you know, freshwater systems that we can begin to really monitor this kind of activity uh, very, very quickly. Did you want to thank, mention? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's it. yeah, thanks so much, Scott and, and Rick. And um, we'll, as I said at the beginning, we'll open up for questions after we get through all yeah. of our speakers. So, uh, Brian, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to do that? Yeah, if you could do that, please. Okay. So take it away, Brian. Okay, I only have a half a screen. There it is. Okay, you can go to the next slide, uh, please. Mary, next slide. There you go. I was asked to talk a little bit about, about controls or what we can do about this in the short and long term. <clears throat> and in looking through everything, it seems that it's a variety of way that, ways that communities deal with cyanobacteria blooms. The most common right now in Massachusetts is its avoidance. If there's a drinking water supply, uh, like out in Ohio, there was a big problem in Lake Erie a few years ago, 16. Uh, and here, if there's drinking water, then they just put restrictions and you can't pump that water. Thankfully, most of the Cape Cod is on wells right now, which at least for, for cyanobacteria is is solves that problem, but it doesn't solve it for contact, which is beach closures is what we've been doing. That's pretty much what we see is how the managers deal with, with the short-term problem. If there's high cyanobacteria or high microcystin or other uh, toxins, you just close the beach. Uh, there's three other things that people have done typically in this region, not necessarily in Massachusetts, but in this region. One is algicides. Uh, there's been some talk, the reason I put this in there is some talk in Mashpee actually of using algicides to combat cyanobacteria. An example would be copper sulfite. There's also organic uh, algicides, but the problems with those is they cause, they have secondary metabolites, which also then are toxic over a long period of time. So that can be an issue. The, <clears throat> the main long-term solution though is nutrient controls or source reductions. Uh, for instance, there's a, a multi-billion dollar effort in the Everglades to prevent freshwater flow from going into the St. Lucie estuary. And uh, the idea is they'll reroute the, the load and they'll also lower the, the phosphorus levels mainly in that load. And in lakes like in Santuit or in Mashpee Wakefield, it would be lowering nitrogen and phosphorus levels. It's a little tricky because nitrogen and phosphorus react differently with cyanobacteria. I'll get to that in a second. The other thing that, that has been tried, although it's not accepted in Massachusetts, is, is mechanisms of altering the planktonic community, which I'll 
I guess I'll say it right now that the, what people do is there's a series of companies, usually from Flor Florida, that come in and they grow up populations of microbes and they, from the, the actual lake and then they, they put it uh, back in the lake at very high concentrations with the idea of altering the phytoplankton and, and bacterial microbial community. Uh, nothing is, is yet um, uh, okayed for Massachusetts use yet. And actually at the university, we're testing uh, some of those techniques right now to see if they're if they function the way they're supposed to. Next slide. Next. Thanks. Algicides, you know, they do work. You add them. Uh, we worked in a Scott Pond in Rhode Island, and they still use copper sulfate in that every year. There's other problems with doing that, but they do give immediate effectiveness on cyanobacteria blooms. The problem is it generally kills all of the phytoplankton and some of the zooplankton. So what happens is, is that after you knock down the cyanos, that, that they can regrow because you've knocked out their competitors and you've knocked out their grazers. The other issue that, that is not generally discussed is, is that if you use algicides, you typically reduce the organic phosphorus from the dead or dying cells, uh, phytoplankton cells mainly, and, and cyanobacteria are one of the few phytoplankton that can actually use that phosphorus in organic forms to grow. So you're actually fertilizing the remaining cells or the cells that are trying to come back. So there's an issue there. All of this stuff, cyanobacteria are so tricky. They're tricky to measure. Uh, I guess unless you have a laser, Scott, but, but they're tricky to measure. They're tricky to handle. Next. Okay, so mainly what we're focused on longer solutions is reducing the nitrogen and phosphorus levels in these freshwater ponds or in estuaries. Uh, the, the, the problem with cyanobacteria is they're tremendously competitive uh, phytoplankton <clears throat> or phototrophs. They can fix nitrogen into organic matter. In other words, they can take nitrogen gas out of the air and fix it and, and use that for growth when nitrogen levels are low in the environment. Whereas the other phytoplankton are trying their hardest just to get the inorganic nitrogen that's there in the water. So just lowering inorganic nitrogen levels is not enough to get rid of cyanobacteria. You have to worry about the organic phosphorus as well. What they also can use, and they can use that organic phosphorus, but the, the problem is, is that they can fix nitrogen and they can use organic phosphorus, which most other phytoplankton can't use either. So they have a, a twofold competitive advantage. It's, they don't have to worry necessarily about nitrogen limitation and they have other sources of, of phosphorus. So just lowering inorganic phosphorus again, which is what a lot of the techniques do, like for instance, alum and uh, phospholock and aeration, they lower the inorganic forms mainly, but not the organic forms. So again, competitive advantage. So what you have to do is you have to take very care, much care when controlling nitrogen phosphorus levels, not to tip a balance into making the, the competitive advantage of cyanobacteria even more competitive over the standard uh, greens and other phytoplankton um, than they normally are. Uh, the main way though that we're controlling nitrogen phosphorus would either do watershed nitrogen reduction or we control the phosphorus in the ponds typically. For the watershed where you have to control, and we're working on this now all over the place, controlling surface water inflow. Storm water typically has high phosphorus in it. Fertilizer runoff in agriculture typically supplies phosphorus, which tends to cause algal blooms, both cyanobacteria and regular phytoplankton. Groundwater has generally been talked about as not transporting phosphorus, but actually it's not true. Septic systems within about 300 feet of a pond after many years will typically deliver that inorganic phosphorus to the pond waters. So actually soaring for nitrogen to protect the estuaries also would remove the phosphorus to protect the ponds. So you get a twofer. You do in-pond treatment, which there's a lot of 15 ponds, I think, on the Cape have been done for this. It only works if the sediment phosphorus released from it is very high. And if it is high, then you want to knock that down. And the main way to do it is you try to lock the phosphorus into the sediments and not let it out. You can do it by aerating the, the, the pond, which is not perfect, but it does knock down on chemical release of phosphate, which can be very high in the summer in our anoxic bottom ponds. Even Mashpee Wakeby has an anoxic bottom water. You can use alum or another binding agents, which will typically take out, um, strip some phosphorus from the bottom water, but also prevent phosphorus from coming out. But it's a temporary fix, just like dredging is a temporary fix. And it's, 
the alum and other binding agents and dredging are temporary because what happens is as long as phosphorus is going into the pond, you'll have a rain of organic matter to the bottom carrying phosphorus. And after a number of years, you'll build up a new layer and you'll either have to dredge again or add alum again or another binding agent again. A new method which is going on on the Cape, mainly Brewster in Walker's Pond is plant harvest to remove the phosphorus and, and that has met with limited success. And that's it. I think you, everybody can see that each one of our experts could talk for an hour on this. And so I appreciate that everybody's condensed it down so that we get such an amazing uh, overview of everything. So the last person that's gonna uh, share with us is uh, Andrew Gottlieb, Mashpee Select Board member. And uh, I'll let you take it away, Andrew, and then I'll try to um, facilitate some questions. That, that's Mary's very polite way of telling me to keep it short. Um, so, and I will, um, let me just boil this down to, um, you know, some essential elements as far as the town is concerned. Um, you know, I think that there's been a significant awakening in Mashpee, both at the political elected leadership level, as well as the general population to the reality that we've, um, you know, had a significant impact on all our waterways. Um, and a consensus around the need uh, to address it. Um, I would say that the consensus has crystallized around interventions that are somewhat more conventional in nature, in particular, centralized wastewater treatment and sewering. Uh, the town has a plan um, over a, at least a 25 year period to manage nitrogen that is focused and was developed um, exclusively around remediation of our two embayments, Papanesset and McCoy. Um, it does a phase sewering program that uh, in five year blocks until we've reached the point where we've reduced nitrogen inputs into the ground to a degree that in combination with Ashley shellfish program, um, we see a response in the bays that, and a restoration of the habitat that has been lost. The lakes were not explicitly part of the design of that wastewater program. It was a nitrogen control program focused on the estuaries. A lot of the work that, uh, that underpinned uh, the nitrogen loading came from Brian's uh, seminal work through the Massachusetts Estuaries Program. Um, and the lakes are part of, but an ancillary part of uh, our control program. The lakes come in when from the analysis the town did with its wastewater engineer, um, it was appropriate to bring the lakes into the treatment uh, when it benefited the estuaries, not necessarily timed and conceived to benefit the lakes as ecological entities unto themselves. Um, and that was done at the time because the emphasis was on nitrogen and the, and the marine waters. And we all kind of knew in the back of our mind that the day was going to come when we needed to deal with the fresh waters. And I think there's a consensus now that, that has in fact happened. Um, so, um, the lakes do not appear in the mastery sewer program until phase three. We are just commencing phase one. Um, so... You know, we are a good, according to the plan, decade away from putting forward a sewering program that, that affects the lakes. And I think we've all recognized that that's not an acceptable outcome, not an acceptable time. Board of Selectmen has voted to um, ask the Sewer Commission, which has largely the jurisdiction over the implementation of our sewering program, uh, to accelerate consideration of the lakes into phase two, which is the next one that's up. In order to do that for Mashpee Wakeby, we need a diagnostic study that we're going to town meeting for in October, seeking funding authorization so we can understand what really is happening in the lake, what are the relative loads, where are they coming from, how's the lake behaving so we can come up with an effective management strategy that incorporates the kind of things we'd need in order to achieve our outcome. Uh, there is largely sufficient information 
uh, in the town on Santua to Schumann and Johns. Uh, so we are not pursuing additional analyses for those. Um, and I think that once our phase one of our sewer program, which is the treatment plant and the area immediately south of uh, the transfer station along 28 gets um, designed and out to bid, uh, it'll be a reasonable time frame to sort of shift the conversation uh, over the course of this winter to what are we going to, how are we going to incorporate the lakes into, into this program? In the short term, um, we are, and you all should have received a letter from the town manager asking people to cease fertilization of their properties as a way to begin to do something that is not intended to solve the problem in the absence of other interventions, but taking fewer nutrients or putting fewer nutrients into the groundwater system, into the freshwater systems can do nothing but help. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not proposed as a solution, but it's an immediate action that we can all take. So that's where we are. We have a lot of work to do um, to get us to the point of being on a track that solves the problem, but the speed at which there's been this recognition that we need to deal with the freshwater issues is so much greater than what has occurred on the marine side that even though it's gonna take some time, um, there's I think good reason for optimism that we will get ourselves pointed in the right direction in a relatively sh short period of time. I'm done. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. That's great. Um, before we jump in with questions, I, I just want to recognize um, Meredith Harris and Jonathan Small. Uh, they're part of a group that's that's organizing the residents around uh, Wakeby specifically, and um, I think you know certainly there will be information as they launch their efforts. We'll share information on our Mashpee Clean Waters Facebook page and. Um, you know, welcome you to, I, I don't know if you guys have any updates that you want to share or just. Well, I'll just say something real quick. Um, I mean, I think a group of us became radicalized over the last uh, couple of months as as our our precious lake became threatened. And so I I echo what Andrew was saying that, um, you know, there's, there's a real mobilization. We've had uh, now two gatherings of uh, several dozen people um, concerned residents, and we don't want this to be a group that is just focused on lake residents, but also, you know, um, anyone who uses the lake or cares about the lake, we hope to be engaged and involved in it. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so we're a small enough group that uh, I, I welcome people, if you want to unmute your, your uh, microphone and ask a question, or if you want to use the chat to ask questions, that's fine too. Can I jump in with a quick question now that I sort of have the floor? Sure, <laughs> um, I, I know that there's no uh, definitive science on this, but I'm just wondering if, if uh, all of you or some of you might speculate on what percentage of the problem or the source of the problem is coming from fertilizer as opposed to septic. Is there a way to, to um, sort of quantify that roughly? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 20%? Anything, anything that we can say about that? I can comment on that in general. Um, the Cape Wide study of Mass Massachusetts 208 plan, um, they quantified it as a roughly 11% of all um, input was from fertilizer and runoff. Um, most of our input is coming from our septic systems and wastewater. Um, but it, it is an it is an, a remediation that we can do now. It doesn't cost anything, so that's why we're putting it out to the public. You know, let's start something. Um, you yeah, know, really support your, that. Yeah, yeah, let's reduce your use of fertilizer because it's free, um, and then we'll take care of the bigger picture um, down the road. Um, but that's what the gist of the letter was that we submitted to all of the residents. It's not, you know, do this or whatever, but you. you most educated people will take that letter and say, yes, this is what I'm going to do. I can stop fertilizing, not stop fertilizing, but maybe reduce it. And that's just, you know, a little bit of help to the, to the, the bigger picture here. Um, so that's what we were, our goal was um, when we submitted that letter, or the Board of Selectmen recommended the submission of that letter to all residents in the town of Mashpee. 
Brian? Yeah, it, the, in order to, this diagnostic study that, that Andrew is talking about would actually try to quantify that on a parcel by parcel basis. It's very difficult to give a number. I mean, the number that Ashley gave is good as any, but you don't, it, it depends on how, where the septic systems are relative to the edge of the shore and how important they are. If you're 10 miles away or a mile away in a septic system, the nitrogen makes it to the pond, but the phosphorus probably never will in a millennia. Closer, it makes it to the pond. And then stormwater is a big deal for phosphorus, but it isn't a big deal for nitrogen. So that all has to be worked out, like I said, on a parcel by parcel basis for whichever pond you're doing. And we typically are finding that in some ponds, you have to do sewering to make it. There's no other way you can make the threshold to restore it. But in some ponds, you don't have to do sewering to make the threshold. It's very site specific. But sewering will help if you do it, okay, in any pond. That just reiterates why it's so important that we do diagnostic studies for each individual water body so we can understand the characteristics of input. Right. And then if the remediation of, of those, if, if it doesn't involve sewering, then how, how would that be handled by the town? Is that something on a case-by-case -case basis, you get funding for specific? Yeah. Uh, it's, there's it's yeah. Go, Go ahead, ahead. Ashley. Well, there's multiple tools that you can use and it depends on what the specific cause is. And so just because, say, a town doesn't want to do sewering, they may have three or four other tools to restore that pond that may not be as permanent, but still would be a lot cheaper and could be repeated once or twice in a 50-year period. I think, Mary, it's also, in all likelihood, um, probable that some, ask, some component of the ponds are going to need to be sewered for estuarine purposes. And so I would say the likelihood, given the combination and overlap of those two, um, it's a, it is a probability that we will be doing some sewering around the ponds. The question is, how far up the watershed, in what combination with other interventions that are reliable and replicable so that, you know, you're not, I mean, the, the tendency in situations like this is that interventions that require reliance on people's continued change in behavior don't tend to last very long because people get, I mean, look at masking and gathering. You need an example of people getting fatigued and losing and dropping their guard. I think you're living with it right now. So if you, you know, you do water conservation as a crisis, people perceive this as a crisis, you know, they'll shower with a friend, but they get sick of it. Um, and they go back to what they used to do. So I think, you know, in terms of what we're looking to do, you know, my predisposition is to put in things that are structural, whether they're stormwater control or whether they're sewers that don't rely on the good intentions of the populace. Not because they're bad people, but because sociology tells us that that's not a winning combination. Are there any other questions from the crowd? Mary? Mary, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is um, primarily, I think, addressed to you, Ashley. And I wanted to know if you had gotten a response yet from the letter and about the fertilizer. And are we also talking about the education of landscapers and giving them some help and looking at other kinds of fertilizer that are not as damaging? And has there been any response from the golf courses? Because I think that that might, all, they're, they're heavy users of fertilizers. Okay, so I can just speak on what I know. Um, I've gotten some responses from um, individual companies around town who were concerned on the, the fertilizers that they're using versus what the homeowners are using. They're using a slow release system and homeowners are using what you can buy over the shelf, which are different. And they're, they're harping on, you know, we use this, this is what's recommended, we've done studies, we've worked with the Cape Cod Landscape Committee, and we found that the slow release fertilizer is the best, and I, this is just my opinion, but I feel like the businesses are doing the best they can, but it's it really comes down to the individual homeowners who are applying the fertilizer. Golf courses are also 
heavily restricted on their amount of fertilizer that they can use. And they have to abide by regulations also. Uh, my husband actually works for, uh, used to work for a golf course, but um, they were heavily regulated on what they could use and what they couldn't use as far as slow release systems um, versus the other products. So I think we've gotten more concerns from the individual companies that have come forward and said, you know, they're, you're going to put me out of business, this, that, and the other. But we have sent a um, notification to the Cape Cod Landscape Association on the use of fertilizer and to abide by the town's um, nitrogen control bylaw. So um, I think that they're fully compliant as far as that goes. Um, but it's, it comes down to the people who are applying these fertilizers right before the rain or if they're windy, they're storing it in their yards in the bags and they rip a hole and it's just getting exposed to the rain. Those are situations where it's inevitable to see fertilizer run off into the waterways. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we got, a couple, we got some pushback, but um, we're going to get pushback everywhere. <laughs> I just have one other question, and this is addressed to um, Scott and Rick. And I, I'm fascinated by the technology that you're using in terms of uh, trying to identify the different types of contamination or cyanobacteria. And my question is whether or not you can tell by the types of toxins that you find of what the causes are of those toxins. Great question. Well, it's, it's the reverse. We, we, we monitor and identify the species of cyanobacteria, and then they are known to be able to produce certain toxins, but we have to measure to see if they're there or not, because it's variable. Um, and, and some are not as toxic as others, so. And, you know, there, as we showed, there are many, many different kinds of toxins that can be produced. They're certainly not all produced at the same time. During certain parts of the life cycle of a cell, depend on nutrient status and the age of the cell, how fast they're dividing, how fast or quickly they go into senescence and slow down. Uh, all these factors uh, relate to the type of toxin and quantity, quantity of toxin that a cell may produce. So it's, it's just really variable. Uh, we've done many laboratory experiments and you know, there's thousands of scientists working on this right now. Uh, trying to understand under what conditions do toxins get produced and what types and how much. So that's, uh, and I think it's a great question because we don't know <laughs> much about it, uh, but that's the kind of thing we need to know in order to predict uh, what the future is for these ponds. You know, if, if we reduce phosphorus, is that going to help us out? It certainly helps us out in terms of growth of the cells, but does it reduce toxins? We don't know. Uh, most likely, they're gonna be coupled to some extent, but not necessarily uh, entirely. Like we know the use of phycocyanin as a pigment index of cell concentration uh, could be coupled together, but the production of toxin isn't necessarily coupled to phycocyanin. So to just measure phycocyanin and say, well, there's a lot of toxin present, it's just not right. So we have to be very careful when we make these measurements that we're measuring what we think we are. And so that's, uh, I, you know, I think we, we just need more research, but going on what we have so far, I think it's safe to say that uh, we need to reduce the nitrogen and phosphorus and that's just the, the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you all, you've done a great job in the presentation, it's been helpful. Thanks, Meredith. Um, we had a couple questions in the chat. Um, uh, Ashley's answered about um, whether testing is more efficient in summer or winter, um, that su summer is definitely the most important. Um, then we also had a question about educating folks on fertilizers. I think we addressed that. Let us know if we didn't. But um, uh, Amy asks, you know, why are Mashpee hardware stores still selling Roundup? It, are, are those kinds of chemicals relevant to what we're talking about here? And, um, you know, what, what should we be thinking about as, as uh, citizens? Yes, Andrew, you want to go first? So uh, Massachusetts state regulations preclude towns from individually regulating fertilizer and pesticide product sale or application. There was a brief window about eight years ago uh, when towns had the right to adopt 
um, fertilizer controls. That's when Mashpee did it. Um, the state closed the door on that, preempted local authority to regulate any further because the industry wanted uh, one set of rules, not 351 sets of rules. Um, and so the state Department of Agricultural Resources uh, regulates pesticides and fertilizer applications. The regulations we have in place now are better than nothing, but they're inadequate. Uh, and we are precluded from improving them at this point. Is that something that it's possible that will change on a state level or? I think you're gonna need legislation to give towns the authority, return to towns the authority to regulate these types of things. And I would, you know, it's a worthy conversation to have. Um, it's gonna be really hard. Um, the reality is that, you know, towns, with all due respect to the great staff that we have are not necessarily qualified to do epidemiological studies to decide whether Roundup or Roundup alternative is better or worse or indifferent. Um, the state does have some authority. They are loath to use it um, for a variety of lobbying reasons. So, you know, you give it back to the towns. It's a tough nut to crack though. Um, so, you know, don't really know the right answer on that. I think the fertilizer thing is easier. Um, and it may be that we ultimately, as a, as a community of 15 Cape Towns, make the case that as we have been able to achieve with financing authority, that because of the unique nature of our aquifer and the sensitivity of our water resources, that collectively we ought to have the ability again to regulate fertilizers differently than is done elsewhere. That might be a conversation we can have with some productivity, but towns on a one-off basis looking for exemptions have almost no shot. So, and I, I mean, I think there, there's a story there on, on the education side. I, I noticed, Ashley, that you talked about a grant for holding informational sessions in the future. You wanna mention that quickly? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the town of Mashby just received a, a grant through the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, and um, the grant is to assess alternative treatments to sand to it pond for the cyanobacteria. So what we're going to do is uh, our DPW assess stormwater input, and now we're looking at other than public areas, the private areas for stormwater input, as suggested through the ACOM report. And a large part of the program is educational outreach to the public. Um, so we'll, we'll be holding informational sessions, public service announcements, and a documentary on um, cyanobacteria. And we're going to be wrapping this up within the year. And we're, we're looking for participation because we will be holding a kickoff meeting um, in early October. Yeah, so please let us all know and we'll, we can get that word out and share. That's great to know. I just have um, a couple answers to some of the, the questions that were put on the, the chat. Um, so currently we are not testing Dean's Pond in Papanese just because it isn't a heavily used for recreation. People don't tend to swim there. Um, so we really haven't done any cyanobacteria testing there this year or the past years. Um, and then... How's the town dealing with yard refuse at the dump that must have high concentrations of fertilizer and nitrogen? Uh, the yard waste gets... Um... Uh, ground up and composted and it's available for pickup to individual uh, sticker holders for application in their yards. So it's not a significant problem that it's going back in? Um, you know, stormwater, stormwater and runoff from the, the landfill, it's a, it's a cap facility because of its former history and life as a hazardous waste site. So the surface of the landfill is actually disconnected from the groundwater. Um, and we have leachate control and the like. So, um, you know, most of the yard waste comes in, it gets composted and it goes back out in, in barrels into people's yards. You know, and I would suggest it's probably a better way to amend soil than the application of an equivalent amount of fertilizer on a, somebody's yard. So I, a couple. I was gonna, I was gonna have uh, two comments and a question. I have one comment and two questions. Um, 
I think both of the questions are to Andy. Uh, so uh, I, I, I was aware, you know, we adopted the fertilizer bylaw that prohibited phosphorus after the initial year. Are you saying that is no longer effective in Mashpee? No, I'm saying it is in effect. It is in effect. We have no ability to amend it or make it more stringent. Right. Okay. Well, it was pretty stringent to begin with. But uh, the second question or comment is that um, particularly for Mashpee Wakeby Pond and to a certain extent Santuit Pond, uh, a good part of the what's flowing into the pond is coming from the town of Sandwich. And I was wondering if you're having any, like we did with the, the you know, the agreement on Papanese, whether there's any discussions with Sandwich about the uh, issue in a wake deep pond, because you've got the artisan way area on one side that's very densely populated, and the other side you got the cranberry bogs and the, uh, the 40B project there that are probably the biggest loads to wake deep pond. And uh, as the upper part of the pond is where water's flowing in, the lower part and the east side, water is actually flowing out of the pond in terms of the groundwater. So is there anything going on with Sandwich? Yeah, I've been talking to Sandwich Town Administration about collaborative opportunities and whether we end up with <clears throat> shared facility or joint facility um, up at Jan Sebastian Way, which is where they're contemplating having a treatment facility in the event, uh, in the likely event that the treat, uh, treatment plan at the base does not come to fruition. So we've had some early stage conversations about, you know, having a combined system, whether the Mashpee part and the northern part of the pond ends up going up to a sandwich treatment facility and discharge there, whether it comes down and the sandwich portions that we would be picking up in our system come down to the transfer station site. We're having early, you know, we're talking about it. We're not there yet. Okay. And the, the comment uh, just uh, was that every one of these ponds is different. I mean, uh, the, you know, the reference was made to the ACOM study in the Santuid Pond case where they say 78% of the phosphorus is being recycled from the bottom sediment. So that's a big issue. Only 5% is a sewer issue. So that's the, that's on that pond, that's a big issue. Mashpee Wakeby is probably quite different. Santua was surrounded by 150, for 150 years by, you know, acres and acres of cranberry bogs. Mashpee's only got, you know, that little one up in, in <laughs> the there. there. So, I'm sure it's different. And Mashpee is a much deeper pond. Sand, sand, you know, Santua is, what, seven feet deep. So right. each pond is going to be different. And in the case of Santua, the sewer part is, is minuscule in terms of the contribution now. And unless we can get rid of the, take care of the sediment, the 78% that's recycling from the sediment in the water column. That, that may be that there are situations, and Santua may be among them, where sewering by itself will not solve the problem. But... At some point, we have to arrest the introduction of additional nutrients into the system, oh, yeah. or we're going to continually be replicating and repeating um, these bus boom cycles. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that sewering by itself is sufficient to deal with sand to it, but in the absence of sewering, we're dooming our kids or grandchildren to repeating this cycle because eventually that nutrient load is going to get to the point where it causes the pond problems. I'm, I'm going to interject. Thank you to both of you for that. Um, we have a couple quick questions. Um, Meredith um, wants to uh, jump in and ask a question. Can you unmute? Posted the qu I did. I posted the question. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but I just by chance happened to run into a Barnstable County tester in Falmouth today. And um, he told me that he only tests for E. coli. Um, does that, do they test in Mashpee? Is it relevant to our situations yes. here? Yeah, yeah, it is, Meredith. They, um, they test in Mashpee at the public swim beaches and 60 of the... Um, sites that Barnesville County is testing at public swim beaches. They are also testing for cyano that they then send to APCC for analysis. So there is overlap. There are two separate jurisdictional questions and tracks, but um, one of the ways the APCC program tripled this year was the partnership with um, Barnesville County to, to have their samples samplers do double duty when they're out. Great, thanks. Jonathan Small, did you have something that yeah, you want to Can I share my screen real quick, Mary? Oh, 
Yeah, if it's real quick, because we're at our time, but. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share, someone in our group, is that is that coming across? Yes. Someone in our group shared this um, aerial footage of Mashpee Wakeby and said it came from 2018. Uh, I'm just wondering if that rings any bells for anybody, and and if it was, if if that is true, why this wasn't like a, a glaring red, or I actually want to say green blue signal uh, back then that something was was awry in in the pond. Any any reflections on that or thoughts on that? Take a look at Santuwa Pond in the bottom right. <laughs> Compared to they were. So that's probably um, what you're seeing there is a bloom, a low level bloom, not as, as high as seen to it, but we've seen um, high cell counts or higher cell counts in the wake bee side versus the mash bee side. And then that's, you know, it's due to depth and the transfer and the flow. So that's why it's very important to do this diagnostic study so we can see the interaction between the two two waterways, and I, I call them two waterways because they're separated only by a narrow piece of sliver of water. So um, that's what we'll find out in our, our diagnostic study is what's going on here and what, where's the, where are these nutrients coming from? Um, are they coming, they're most likely not coming from the bog. I mean, that's probably a portion of it, but it's most likely going to be from stormwater, fertilizer, and septic system, but we can find the areas and identify them through a diagnostic study. But no, that is, that definitely looks like there's a bloom occurring there back in 2018. Yeah, all right, thank you. Well, um, thank you to everybody. As I said at the beginning, um, number one, these are really complex problems and it's, you know, we're fortunate to have so many smart people doing a lot of work on this, but obviously we have our work cut out for us. And, you know, I, I view our role as citizens is to try and be as educated as we can and then advocate for solutions to these challenges. So uh, thank you to all our experts and thank you to all our, our citizens, local uh, folks who care about the environment. And uh, hopefully we can continue these conversations and, and do what we can. Ashley, let us know as these programs come on and uh, we'll try to spread the word and uh, do what we can to rally the resources because I, I think you know, we are going to have to speed up our our solutions here. And just so, a final I mean, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let any of you last words, our, our speakers. Yeah. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, just a final note is if um, anybody from the community has any questions, you can always email me. Um, you can find my email address on the Department of Natural Resources at the town website. And I always return phone calls and emails, so. Great. Anyone else? Um, again, you know, it's along the lines with Ashley, you know, uh, selectmen can get emailed uh, at the town website. So if you have questions, concerns, or issues, uh, you can get a hold of me that way. And it would behoove you to um, share your concerns with the other four members of my board so they realize it's an issue of broad public concern. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much. We ran a little bit over, but we appreciate everybody coming and um, thanks to everybody. And let's keep talking and see what we can do here. Thanks for coming, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you so thanks. much. Thanks. Take care. Thank you all.